My name is Jeff Warner. I'm a Los Angeles County Master Gardener. Here today to talk about uh, fruit trees, how to grow them, some of the issues with them. I'm being assisted today by uh, uh, three other Master Gardeners, Joanna, Monica, and Sarah. I'm going to cover this, uh, first talk about, uh, you know, the, the types of trees we can grow, climate issues, how to, how to you know, select the proper site for your tree, uh, get into planting, a little bit about pruning. We'll take a break at that point, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about this a citrus disease that's affecting L.A. County right now. Okay, so L.A. County is a great place for growing citrus, uh, or, or growing all kinds of fruit trees. Uh, we have this a Mediterranean climate, uh, which is nice in-between climate. It's not too hot, not too cold in the winter, and we can grow uh, trees from temperate, tropical, and subtropical areas, all the whole spectrum. Uh, the pictures here, we see some pomegranates, loquats, uh, apples, uh, nectarines, uh, my favorite uh, fig there, the panache fig, and uh, jujube. So the, uh, the first area, the first type of fruit we can grow, and probably the most common fruit grown in, in California besides citrus, are the temperate zone uh, fruits, like stone fruits, apricots, cherries, peach, plums, and hybrids, mostly plum hybrids with the other ones like plum and, plum and peach and plum or plum and cherry. A lot of really great hybrids that are available now. Most, a lot of those are new. Uh, we can also grow uh, uh, apples and pears and quince. Those are all in the same family. Those are all closely related. They're all part of the rose family. And then a whole bunch of other things like figs and mulberries, pawpaws, persimmons, pomegranates, et cetera. We'll talk about a few of those. So these are some of the interspecifics that, uh, that they've been hybridizing, they're called. They're, they're taking, these, these plants are all in the same genus, so they're all closely related, they're all prunus. Uh, they, and, but they, they're making a lot of these great hybrids, uh, and many of these are an advantage over the non-hybridized ones for growing in California because they don't need as much chill uh, in the winter to produce fruit in summer. And I'll tell you what that means in just a minute. And besides that, we can grow some things that are much less, well, some of these are common, some less common, but tropical and subtropical. Uh, you know, from some of the citrus, that's subtropical, uh, to uh, avocados, lychees, longans, mangoes, dates, you know, white sapote, or maybe it's green sapote, white sapote, dragon fruit. These are all, uh, you know, uh, fairly tropical things, but they grow pretty well here, especially if you're in the hotter uh, parts of LA. Is we have a, we we have what's called a subtropical climate. Uh, it's a Mediterranean version of a subtropical climate, which is which has hot summers and it's hot dry summers and cool wet winters. Uh, but there are a few things you see here that are actually pretty tough to grow in our climate. Uh, people do it. I belong to a group called the California Rare Fruit Growers, uh, and uh, some of the members of that group, uh, you know, who are just you know crazy about fruit trees. Uh, and we have tried some of these things. I've tried a couple of these. I've got a, a, a couple of jackfruit plants I've grown from seed, uh, but they're really struggling. Uh, they're, they're hard to grow. They'll be easier to grow in a coastal area, I think. Uh, and the miracle fruit is the only one I'm trying. I really wanted to try that one. If you guys haven't heard of miracle fruit, uh, after you've eaten a piece of that fruit, it, it actually modifies your taste buds. So anything sour tastes <laughs> sweet. So a lemon would taste like lemonade after eating this fruit. And so I was so excited to I wanted to try that. Uh, but the plant just will not grow for me. I've, I've kept it alive for three years, but that's about it. So one of the first considerations when you're thinking about uh, picking a tree is understanding how cold hardy the tree is and how cold it gets here. Uh, the USDA has created a system for this. And uh, it's, it, it, it'll show you the zones in just a second, but you can get an idea here about how uh, cold hardy, how much cold different types of fruit can take. So pap papaya, for instance, are not very cold hardy at all. As soon as it drops into freezing, uh, papaya trees start to die. Of course, it depends how long the, the cold period lasts, but uh, uh, many of these things will get damaged, including citrus. Uh, limes and lemons you know, are, are pretty sensitive. Uh, some citrus, though, like, man uh, like mandarins or um, I think like Meyer lemon, and uh, kumquats, they're actually quite cold tolerant. So you can, in colder areas, those are just fine. Uh, but then you get into things like peaches and apples and those things were evolved in a very cold climate. And so cold is not a consideration at all for us here. Uh, it, certainly not being too cold. 
So this is a map you can see of uh, what the U.S. De defines as the hardiness zones, and it, it just means that uh, it, it, they, they, divide it, they divide the whole country up into uh, uh, zones based on 10 degree increments. So each zone is 10 degrees colder than the other zone, and A and B are, ha are half increments. And you can see here, uh, you know, if you go up into the mountains or high desert like Lancaster, it can get down to 15 to 20 degrees, uh, which is good for certain types of fruit, but bad for citrus and tropicals. Uh, but if you go out to Palos Verdes, it, it, never, it seldom gets down into to freezing. So this is sort of the average low temperature. Uh, it's it's going to drop sometimes below that, and sometimes you'll get damage in your area. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. So besides just sort of the general climate, we want to understand our microclimates. And that's just, you know, your yard is full of microclimates based on where the, how the sun moves across your property, uh, where your walls are, where your trees are. Uh, is so the, your south facing part of your, you know, the part of your house that faces the sun in the south, that's always the hottest part of your yard. And that's the best part for gardening in general, for your fruit trees, for your vegetable garden. Uh, the east and west are next. And the north side of your property is the coolest. Uh, but you can still garden there. Uh, you know, certain things will, are fine in the, in the cool weather. Uh, but all of our fruit trees require at least six to eight hours of sun during the summer. Uh, without that sun, the tree can do just fine, but you're not going to get good fruit development, and especially with fruit that needs heat to sweeten. Uh, you really want as much sun exposure as you can get with most of those. So like I showed you before, apples, of course, are very cold hardy. You can grow those pretty much anywhere in California. Uh, citrus, less so, and there's, you know, in between much, many of the other ones. But we can grow all these if you pick the right spot in your yard. Uh, if, you, if your property's sloped, the cold air flows down, flows down uh, hills like water does, and it collects uh, at the base of things and gets trapped. And so you normally don't want to uh, plant a cold sensitive plant somewhere at the bottom of a hill uh, where, where the winter cold may be worse than other parts of your property. But if you're gonna grow a stone fruit plant or an apple, you want that cold during the winter. So that's actually, it, that may be the ideal place for that plant. So you just have to kind of learn where to put it. Now, that picture there, the papaya, papayas, everybody I've seen who grows papayas grows them up against either uh, some kind of a masonry wall or their house. Uh, so they get the heat that radiates off of that at night. Uh, you know, it heats up during the day, you know, your masonry, your sidewalks, your, your house, everything heats up during the day. And then it re-radiates it re that heat at night. And that can be very beneficial for plants that are heat, uh, heat sensitive or, or cold sensitive rather. So uh, temperate zone fruit trees, these are trees that evolved in a climate that normally uh, had heavy snow during the winter. And these trees go completely dormant. They lose all their leaves. And this is the way they stay alive during the winter time. Uh, but at the same time, they don't wanna wake up out of dormancy uh, because there's a little warm spell in the middle of winter. If they wake up and they, start, and they go into bloom and start leafing out, and then it, then it freezes again, that kills off that new growth. You'll lose your whole fruit crop. Uh, the tree won't necessarily die, but it'll get damaged by coming out of dormancy too early. So they've evolved a mechanism to stay dormant until enough cold has passed. They, they don't have a calendar, but they have an internal, an internal mechanism to monitor how many hours of cold they've experienced. And that cold is defined as temperatures below 45, but above freezing. And so many of these things, uh, many, you know, many apples and other fruit require more cold hours than we get here in Southern California. Some apples take up to a thousand hours uh, of annual of, of, you know, cold accumulation in order to bear fruit in the summer. Uh, but other things need very little, like a pomegranate and figs need maybe a hundred hours. And tropical fruit doesn't need any cold at all. They, they didn't evolve in a, in a climate that gets cold in the winter, and so they don't have a mechanism to monitor it. And there's a whole, but there's a whole bunch of varieties. These are all different stone fruit and apple pear varieties that are good for our area because they don't require as much cold. The people, the breeders have been working really hard on this issue, trying to uh, create plants that have really good quality fruit, but that don't have, require too much cold, so we can grow them here in our warmer climate. Uh, things like figs, persimmons, and pomegranates, really, they don't really need to, to select for that because they're naturally uh, require little chill, only 
150 hours, usually quite a bit less than 150 hours. That's sort of on the high side for those. So you can go to the site here, uh, put out by UCANR. It keeps track of the cold accumulation uh, by having these 11 weather stations. And so what you need to do is go to the weather station that is closest to you and, uh, and see what happens. This little graph here is just showing how the, uh, how the cold accumulates uh, starting in November through the end of February. And, uh, and you can see some years, it this is at one location and it varies a lot each year. So one year here, like 2016, they barely got maybe 15, 20 hours of cold at the West Hills location. Uh, but uh, you know, 2000, the next year, 2015, they got about 300 hours. So it can vary quite a bit from year to year. Okay, good. So now you're seeing the, hopefully the cumulative chilling hours. And I, uh, you can look at like this, 2019 is actually the current year because they start uh, uh, counting back in, in November of last year. And so uh, Palmdale, like I said, you get over a thousand hours this year. So you can grow virtually any temperate uh, uh, fruit tree you want and get good production there. Uh, in fact, you might not want the low chill varieties because you might have some uh, cold damage to those come out of dormancy too early. But here I'm near Pomona, so we get about 400 hours. So I'm more limited, but if you're in Santa Monica, uh, there's a lot of these things you, you, you won't be able to successfully grow. It doesn't get enough chill during the winter to do much production in, in the summer. So besides that, you also wanna know about your, your soil a little bit. And the most basic thing is understanding soil texture. And this has to do with just the mineral part of your soil, the sand, the silt, and the clay. And there's a really easy test to do called the jar test. And you just take a sample from your backyard. Uh, you dig down a little bit. You don't want the debris from the surface, the mulch and other things from the surface. Uh, you want to dig out a little bit deeper, uh, take a nice sample, uh, break it up really good, uh, take out any rocks, and you put it into a, a, you know, like a pickle jar, a mayonnaise jar, uh, and fill it up with water, shake it up really good, and let it settle. And sand will settle out in just seconds, and so you mark that. Uh, silt will settle out within about 30 minutes, you mark, you mark where that is, and then you might have to wait a few days, at least a day, maybe longer, for the clay content to fully uh, settle out. So you wanna wait until the jar is no longer cloudy on top and then you mark that. Then you figure out the percentages and from that you can tell what, uh, what type of, uh, uh, of uh, soil you have. And that affects mostly drainage, water holding capability and nutrient holding capability. So I have a very sandy soil in my yard. I barely, I, I, I'm up in the foothills. Uh, it, it has very, very little clay. And so my soil dries out extremely quickly. And, and it doesn't hold nutrients like fertilizer very well. If you live somewhere more in a valley area, you might have a very heavy, heavy clay soil that doesn't drain very well, but it will hold nutrients much better and stay wet much longer. So you really wanna know that information. Some fruit trees like citrus and avocados in particular uh, are very sensitive to being wet around the root. You know, they don't want the soil to be wet. Uh, damp but not wet. And if you have soil that stays really wet, you'll end up with root rot with those type of plants unless you take special measures and how you plant them. And I'll show you that too. Uh, the other thing you can do is a drainage test where you dig a, like a one cubic foot hole, one by one by one, fill it with water once, let it drain completely, fill it up again, and now time it as it drains out and see how long it takes. You want to you test it at different stages so you can get a rate of drainage. And if it's draining, you know, two to three inches per hour, that's, that's good. But if it's less than one inch, it's a little bit concerning. And some soil may take a lot longer than that, one inch per hour. And if it's draining too fast, my soil drains too fast, um, it's, uh, that's also a concern because you, it's, hard to, it's hard to keep the plants uh, evenly moist and to keep nutrients in their vicinity. But we can fix a lot of this through mulching and compost use. If your soil has a lot of clay, you can till compost into it, and you can also use gypsum that'll help create a better texture. Um, uh, sandy soil, you also use mulch, but in that case, the mulch is acting to hold nutrients in water, and so it's going to help reverse the, the fast draining pro problem. Uh, but you don't want to do that right when you're planting a tree. You do that ahead of time. So then when it comes to uh, selecting a tree, you're gonna, you're gonna go to the nursery and you're, you're gonna have some different options. Uh, mostly you're gonna find potted trees, uh, like these avocados that I'm showing here. There's a, these pots are, used to be called gallon pots. It'd be a five gallon and a 15 gallon. Well, it turns out nursery pots are always smaller 
than their stated size. And so they're no longer allowed to call them gallon size. They call them number fives and number 15s. Uh, a new tree that's been, you know, was planted a year ago and they're ready to sell now, those are usually going to be in your five gallon pots. Uh, and that's what I usually start with because what happens when you plant a tree that's maybe a year apart, those two trees, uh, the, like in that picture there, the, the, the tree, the, the smaller tree will catch up pretty quickly with the bigger tree. It doesn't take very long uh, for them to catch up once they're, you know, once they're in the soil and doing better because they grow faster in the soil than they're going to grow in the pot. And if it's the right time of year, you'll also have options for bare root trees. In January and February, for the most part, is when apples and peaches and pears are, are sold as bare root plants. These are plants that are grown in the soil uh, on the farm, and they use a special tractor with a U-shaped tool that comes through and just cuts them out of the ground uh, with some root ball left, and they wash all the soil off of it and then put it into something like these wood shavings you see here. Uh, to keep the roots moist. And so you buy it without any soil around it. And this is actually ideal for plants that go dormant in the winter time. These plants are asleep right now. Uh, they don't mind being handled roughly, uh, but you do have to keep those roots moist. Uh, so you can buy, you, you'll see, you don't see too many places carrying these anymore, except for the, the big box, ironically, stores carry these. Uh, they're usually bagged up there, so you won't see the root ball. Uh, but this is nice because you get a chance to really inspect the roots. When you get a plant in the pot, you might have problems that you're not seeing that they're in the root ball. So if you see a lot of surface roots or other things in a planted pot, you probably, you probably don't want to buy that plant. At the very least, uh, talk to the people at the nursery and see if they'll pull the plant out of the pot so you can look at those roots and get an idea whether that plant is a good one to start with. Because when they're growing in the pot, a lot of times the roots uh, start circling and even growing from the bottom back up through the root ball. And you're gonna have to correct that if you're gonna plant that plant. Those circling roots, if they're planted into the soil, will actually uh, end up, uh, uh, they can actually end up killing the tree over a period of years. Uh, so you really don't want that, and uh, it's it, it better not to start with a tree that has that problem. So there's, the other issue is uh, most fruit trees are grafted. So you're buying two trees, basically. You're buying a tree that has different roots than it has on the top. Uh, the, the top part is called a scion and the bottom part is called rootstock. And the reason we do that is because there's a lot of soil diseases uh, that uh, particularly citrus and other things, uh, if you grow them on their own roots, they typically uh, will have problems. Uh, they'll have a disease issue, root rot, and other things. And so they have varieties that are resistant to those diseases that they grow just for the roots and they graft on the desirable fruit variety on top. And uh, the other thing that, you, that the, the other reason rootstock is, is used is because it, uh, it can be helpful in size control. There are rootstocks that'll uh, dwarf a tree or semi-dwarf a tree. Uh, and there are other rootstocks that'll actually make the tree more vigorous. It depends on what you're trying to achieve with your rootstock. So uh, things like the, that list there of apples, citrus, persimmons, those are all things that are almost certainly going to be on a rootstock. And you can always tell by looking at that little, uh, that little knob at the base of the rootstock. Let me go back to the previous picture. If you look over here where the arrow is pointing, you'll see that little jog in the plant. That is where the, the graft is. And so you want to inspect that and make sure it's healthy. Uh, it doesn't look like it's, it's a place that sometimes gets attacked by beetles and things. I've had that happen to me. Uh, so you want to just you know, inspect it, make sure it looks good. But other trees like figs and mulberries, papayas, they don't have that problem with root diseases so much. And so they're not grafted. They could be grafted. These all graft, except for papayas, I think. These all graft is fine. Uh, but uh, you might want to do that for having a multi-grafted tree, but you don't need to do it for disease issues. And I don't think there's any dwarfing rootstocks for any of these. And so they don't do it for that reason either. So when you go to the nursery, you're going to have, you know, the trees should on the label, it should tell you it's a standard size tree, which can get very large, or a semi-dwarf or a dwarf. Uh, they can be either dwarfed by the rootstock or it could be a genetic dwarf or semi-dwarf. And the, the tree at the, you know, the dwarf there, the D, it looks really tiny in this picture. That's actually not, not that small a tree. That's, that's the size of my biggest tree in my yard. I have a full-grown uh, Washington Naval Orange that I think of as a big tree, and it's, it, but it's that size. I'm keeping all the rest of my trees to about eight feet in size. And I'm doing that through pruning to make it easier 
uh, to, to, to prune the tree, to, you know, to inspect it and to pick the fruit. So uh, when you go to plant a tree, uh, there, there's, you're, you're gonna wanna dig a hole that is no deeper than the root ball. So pull the, pull the uh, plant out of the pot so you can, you can look at those roots before you do anything else. And, uh, and uh, cause you don't wanna dig the soil any deeper than the root ball because what will happen is it'll, the plant will continue to sink over time. And it's very important that the crown of the plant, that's the place where the roots and the trunk meet is not buried. Uh, when the crown gets buried, uh, that's when root rot problems happen. And it's because it's partly because the crown is a place where the plant breathes air through. It's one of the places it's really important for it to have oxygen up there. So that it used to be people would say to dig a really deep hole to loosen up the soil. If you have bad soil, like a hard pan, uh, you want to do that ahead of time. And if, you're, if you do end up digging deeper, then that you compensate by planting the, uh, the tree in a bit of a mound, a little above grade so that when it does sink, it's gonna end up at grade or a little bit higher at the end of it. And uh, so uh, we don't, we put regular soil back in the hole, never, uh, you know, never put in uh, an amendments. It used to be the nurseries always wanted to sell us, you know, compost or other amendments to put in the hole with the tree. Uh, the research has shown that the best thing to do is put the native soil right back around the roots uh, tamp it down and uh, water it in really good because you want to get all the air pockets out of there. But I should have said before you do any of this, inspect your roots and, and make sure you don't have any issues you have to deal with. Uh, I use a method that's been advocated by a number of researchers, particularly up at Washington State University, where I take all the soil off my roots and plant them bare root. And that gives me a chance to spread the roots out, uh, cut off any problem roots, uh, and and I, and I make a little mound at the bottom of, of the hole so I can kind of spread those roots around that mound. And then I really make sure I'm watering it in good. Uh, this is, you don't, probably don't want to do that this time of year because that's going to stress the tree uh, considerably. Uh, but if you're doing it in, you know, in you know, March, April, May, uh, when the weather's still cool, that's a great method. Uh, and the tree almost never needs to be staked when you do that because you spread the roots out and you give it a more stable foundation. And the roots are being set, sent to grow outwards is what you really want because in our, in our uh, urban soils are fairly compacted compared to, to, to out in nature. And tree roots typically don't go down very deep. You know, you may see pictures of roots going down 10, 20 feet deep. Uh, that doesn't really happen in our yards. Uh, most of the roots of your trees are going to be in the first, you know, one or two feet of the soil. And so most of the roots are going to spread out and they're going to spread out well beyond the, the canopy of, of the tree. Some of them will go out two or three times uh, the distance of the canopy. Uh, and so having those roots pointed outwards when you plant it actually gets that process going early. Uh, bare root trees, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to, you're going to see the roots. You just have to make sure you're just, you're just, you know, you're going to bury them so that the, uh, the, uh, the top roots are just an inch or so below the soil. Uh, and that's all you really need to do. Uh, and I, this is the case where I also put a mound in so you can spread those roots. And of course, always water really thoroughly whenever you've planted anything in the garden that includes vegetables and anything else. Uh, it, it just lets the soil settle around the roots and gets all the air pockets out. Now, if you do have drainage issues, uh, you can do a couple things. One is you can just plant in a mound using the native soil. Uh, this is actually good advice for almost anybody planting an avocado. The avocados are so susceptible, they're so notorious uh, for getting root diseases because uh, of wet soil. You really want to make sure they're mounted up. So that looks a little bit like a mulch mound. It's not. It's actually just a thin layer of mulch on top of an earthen mound. Um, and we never want to have a, a mulch volcano around the base of your plants. And in some cases, people are actually planting into uh, a raised bed with a planter mix. And so it's not even native soil. I don't recommend that, but it can be done if you really have poor soil. It just means the roots are not going to have a lot of you know, good space to grow into. So and then mulch, the, the one thing you can do for your entire garden that, that's better than almost anything else would be to uh, put down a woody mulch. Uh, woody mulches, uh, they do so much for our gardens. And this is just, uh, you can get free woody mulch from a service called Chip Drop. Uh, they, you, you just put in information about uh, your location and where you want them to put this. And then they, 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 they make your, your information available to uh, you know, tree cutting services. 
And when they need to get rid of a load of, of trimmings, uh, they can drop it at your house for free instead of paying the dump charges they normally have to pay. So they, so they really uh, enjoy doing it. They really like doing this. Uh, the only downside is you're going to be getting however much they have on their truck that day. And it can be a little or it could be a tremendous amount. It could be up to 20 cubic yards. And so you have to have a place to, you know, to really store that for a while. And it takes quite a while to you know, distribute that much through your yard. It's a lot of work, uh, but it's worth it. I did, I did my, uh, about two thirds of my property uh, uh, in 2017. And I just got another load uh, the last weekend that I'm starting on uh, now because it breaks down. And now I'm down, I started off with maybe a three inch layer three years ago and I'm down to you know, half an inch uh, at most in places. A lot of places have gone bare. And I'm having to water a lot more than I had to before. So uh, mulch, uh, it suppresses weeds, of course, if you have two or three inches. Uh, it provides a blanketing effect, a, a, an insulating effect, because the soil can get too hot for roots. And this will keep the soil up to about 10 degrees cooler. And as it breaks down, it puts organic matter, carbon, into the soil. And that's really important for the, uh, for the soil biological activity. And then it also provides some nutrients uh, very slowly over time as it breaks down. And of course, if you're on a hillside, it will slow soil erosion as well. So really great stuff. And if you can get it for free, you know, you can't beat it. All right, so uh, pruning. We're not going to go deep into pruning. This is, this, is the, this is showing you the two basic cuts. Uh, the, uh, the heading cut is just for shortening a branch. And you always want to cut above a bud, about a quarter of an inch above either a leaf or a bud, because right in the axle of the leaf will be a bud, even if you don't see it. And then that's, and then once you cut that off, uh, that it'll start regrowing from that bud and, and a couple of buds below there. And there's also a removal cut, a thinning cut is called. Uh, and that one, you have, the only trick to that is you want it, you don't want to damage what they call the branch collar. You see that swelling right next to the trunk. Uh, that area helps the, helps the cut heal afterwards. There's special cells in there that, that produce callus tissue. And so we don't want to do a flush cut right against the trunk and we don't want to leave a stub either because the stub will just dry out and it becomes a place for uh, you know, insects or disease problems. So you can see uh, uh, pruning, you know, some of the basics are getting rid of suckers. This is growth from the roots or growth from the base of the trunk, particularly if it's a grafted plant, because uh, if it's coming from the, from the rootstock, that's not, you don't want the rootstock to grow. You just want to have, have roots only. Uh, a lot of times people lose their plants because they don't cut back the rootstock. It takes over, it grows more vigorously typically than the attached plant and it'll actually take over. So if you have a, if you once had a, like a nice sweet mandarin orange tree in your backyard and now it seems to have these really small bitter fruit on it, that's not the original mandarin, that's the rootstock that's taken over. And it can get so bad that the, that the, the mandarin can disappear altogether. It can, you know, it can just wither and die and you have nothing but rootstock, and that's, that's a common problem. Uh, there's also water sprouts, it's very tall vertical growth, uh, especially young trees. Plums put on a good six feet of that type of growth every year, uh, and most of that you wanna remove. Anything really vertical doesn't flower. Uh, it, it'll just produce leafy growth, and it'll, it'll, uh, it'll, put, it'll shade out the rest of the plant. In order for buds to grow, uh, the, the, uh, for fruit buds to go, for flower and fruit buds, you have to have light hitting those branches. And so you don't want it to be shaded out by, by excessive, uh, you know, unnecessary growth. And so you also want to bend your branches down to about 45 degree angles. They'll, they'll, that, that creates a more stable attachment and it, uh, it'll, it allows more light penetration. So you can also train them. There's two systems that are used typically. On the right is one for stone fruit. That's actually the easiest type of pruning system to do. Uh, you can do any tree this way. You just allow a few major branches to grow from the base of the tree, maybe two feet from the ground. Uh, those are called scaffold branches. And you grow it out in sort of this base shape uh, and, and keep everything in the center pruned out. Uh, very easy to do. It allows a lot of light to penetrate the tree, uh, but it, cre it, creates a, you know, it creates sort of an open tree. That may not be the style you want. If you want it to look more like a regular tree, a cone-shaped tree, you can do a central leader um, type or a modified central leader. And this is more typical of apples and things, but you still don't want too many major branches. And so as this tree grows, you're gonna be cutting off uh, excess branches and only allowing, you're gonna have maybe two or three tiers of, you know, three or four branches each. 
uh, and you don't want them to overlap, you know. So ideally, they're, they're sort of like the spokes on a wheel when you look down at the tree, and the, each branch is leaving space for the branch below it. So another thing you need to do is thin fruit. And this is one thing most people don't do. And I have been negligent on this at times. And, and it can be disastrous for your tree. If you, if you have a heavy fruit burden, uh, you can actually lose branches. Uh, but more typically, the fruit just doesn't grow as large or as high, high quality. So this is an example of a peach here. And if you, you want to thin your, thin your peaches so they're about maybe four inches apart, uh, it gives them enough room uh, to grow large and, and uh, and, and sweeten up really good. Another problem with not thinning is certain trees are susceptible to something called alternate bearing. And that's where you'll get a heavy crop one year followed by a really light crop the next year. And it just happens like that every year, it's, you know, teeter totters back and forth. And if you thin your fruit, that's gonna lessen that effect. And some fruit you don't have to thin though, because uh, they'll just naturally drop the fruit they don't wanna carry and go down to a right, the right amount. Uh, my Washington navel, in fact, all my citrus does that, except for my Meyer lemon, which produces too many lemons. So I have to thin that one. The other ones, uh, they, drop their, they drop their excess fruit. It typically happens in June, so it's called June, June drop. Uh, but it can happen other times, too. So the other thing you need to consider when, when thinking about fruit trees is sometimes you can't have just one of a tree. Some fruit trees require cross-pollination from another closely related variety, otherwise they don't produce any fruit or very little fruit. And this is true of many, of apple, many varieties of apples and plums and cherries. It's because they're not compatible with their own, uh, with their own pollen. And evolutionarily, this makes sense because the, you know, ev the evolution wants there to be genetic diversity. And if you allow self-pollination, uh, the children of that plant will have too much of the same genes as the parent. And that makes them weaker uh, in the you know in the race of for survival. Uh, but uh, some varieties are only partially incompatible. And those in those cases, you do get some fruit. You just the fruit's not quite as good or or as plentiful as it would be otherwise. So yeah, so yeah, the, you know, so you hear the word pollinizer, and that just means that companion plant that's providing the, the pollen. And if you go to some websites, like if you look for trees on Dave Wilson's website. When you, when you look up a tree on their site, they'll tell you if that tree needs a pollinizer and they'll suggest a couple of, you know, appropriate pollinizers from that tree. A pollinator, of course, is they're either, uh, you know, bees, birds, and butterflies, and us as well if we hand pollinate. But some, some, some of these are self-fruitful, so one tree is fine. Uh, you know, apricots do that fine. Peaches and pomegranates, citrus. You generally, for most of these, you don't need another a companion plant to get, uh, uh, to get good amounts of fruit. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to make this uh, PowerPoint available so you know, at the end, so you guys don't have to take notes if you don't want. Um, and then there are some trees that are also uh, fruitful by themselves uh, that don't need any pollination at all. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon called parthenocarpy. And things like bananas, uh, they don't need to be pollinated to, for the fruit to form. The fruit just forms uh, from the flower naturally. In fact, you don't want these fruit to get pollinated because then you have seeds in them. Uh, and wild bananas have really hard seeds and, and they're basically inedible because there's so many of them. Uh, persimmons, you'll, you'll find them in the market sometimes with a few seeds. That meant that particular flower got pollinated. Most of the time they don't get pollinated and they're seedless. Uh, I'm not gonna spend really much time on this, but if, you know, when you have a small space and you wanna have a variety of trees, uh, one of your options is to have multi-grafted trees. We have, they're called uh, fruit cocktail trees, uh, but they could, be, they could be problematic. I have a couple of ones. This one here is a plum, and the, you know, the size of these three in the middle here, if you can see these are much smaller than the other two on the outside, and the two on the outside have basically taken over the tree. They're growing too vigorously. It's hard to keep this tree in balance, and, and so it's a, it's a lot of pruning issues. I don't recommend this for beginners. Uh, I also got a pluot that had four that are about the same size, and this one's doing much better. Uh, it's much more balanced, easier to keep, it's easier to keep this tree trimmed properly so that it, uh, uh, it, it produces fruit on all varieties. Uh, you can also plant multiple trees in a hole. This has gotten to be fairly popular. Uh, that's uh, Tom, Smel Tom Spellman. I really recommend his, uh, his videos. He's in the area and uh, knows everything about uh, 
about fruit trees as far as I can tell. And so he's got, there's a video that he does that's demonstrating this technique that's pretty cool. And they recommend, you know, putting certain varieties together. If you go to their website, they'll recommend like those four peaches uh, because not only do they cross pollinate each other, but each one of those produces peaches in a different month. So you go, you got from May through August now. So you got four months of peaches in the, in the, in the space of basically one tree. And you don't have to understand how to do pruning at that or do uh, grafting at that point. So this is showing a little bit more how to do that, but basically you space the trees out, tilt them a little bit away from each other. You know, they can be fairly close, maybe 18 inches. Some people do this, putting the trees maybe two or three feet apart. Uh, depends on what space you have. But you then trim out the center and treat the group like they're an open center tree, like that open base tree, and keep the center pruned out so that the sunlight can get to all of them. So here's some of the common mistakes people make. Uh, the, the first one is picking uh, a high chill variety. Sometimes the nurseries are not carrying the right trees. So you wanna read the label, make sure that the number of hours of chill are appropriate for your area within maybe 100 hours, plus or minus 100 hours is a good ballpark. So if you're really in some place like I am where I get 300 hours typically, uh, if I try to grow a variety that needs 700 hours of chill, I'm not gonna get any fruit. Uh, and I've had friends who called me that I have a friend, for instance, who has an elephant heart plum. He's had it for years. It produces two or three plums a year. That one is mostly self incompatible. It's self sterile. It does produce a few fruit, uh, but he needs to add something like a Santa Rosa plum with it. And that'll provide pollen. That'll make that elephant heart produce a whole lot more. You'll be a lot happier with it. And of course, circling roots, you know, not, you know, planting a tree that uh, really wasn't a good one to start with. Uh, planting too deeply in the root rot, uh, having wet soil. Uh, sunburn can be a big problem in the inland area, and uh, you don't want to over trim your trees uh, so that they don't have, uh, you know, the leaves get burned, that's fine, they get replaced, but you don't want your branches and your trunk to get burned. Uh, if you do have exposed branches and trunk, and I recommend this on pretty much any young tree, uh, you, you paint the, the major branches with whitewash. It's a 50-50 it's a, it's a mixture of a regular you know, indoor house paint, a, like a light color, doesn't have to be white, but you want it to be light, uh, mix 50-50 with water, and you just paint it on the trunk and it uh, provides great sun protection. And the other thing is letting suckers take over, that's a really common problem. And of course thinning as well, you know, it's hard to thin, you hate to throw away something that you really were looking forward to, uh, but you will get better fruit in the long run. And that's, a, that's one of my mistakes there, that's at a church garden I help out with. We pruned that garden, it hadn't gotten much production before, and then a friend of mine and I pruned it out and it produced like crazy, but we didn't go back <laughs> to thin and they didn't know to thin and, it, and several of the major branches on the peaches and apricots just broke off. So that, that tree there lost about half of its branches. So we're gonna take a little break right here. And if there's any questions uh, before I go on to citrus, uh, the master gardener, is there any, any questions or do you have anything you'd like to ask? Okay, I've got a whole list of questions from people who've been asking them on chat. Uh, there's one new message I haven't gotten to yet, but let me start with this. Our steward is saying, I understand we're discussing alternative to citrus trees, yet when you get a moment, could you quickly reference possible remedies for an infected tree? And I think she, what she's referring to is the HLB, uh, by the disease that we're quarantined for. Uh, so uh, are you going to be getting to... Well, I, I will be getting to that next. So I, yeah, that's, that's why we're going to cover citrus next. I mean, normally I would have covered citrus as, one, as the, the major thing to cover because it's probably the most popular thing to grow in our climate. And it's, and it's about the easiest thing to grow in our climate. Uh, however, we have a, a deadly disease right now spreading through Southern California called Wong Long Bing. And that's what I'm going to tell you about because it is incurable. So if your tree has Wong Long Bing, the tree has to be destroyed. And so I'll, I'll tell you what to do if you think you have that disease. Any yeah. other questions? Yes, several actually, and there's more coming in. Michaela, I think, I hope I'm saying your name like Michelle, Michaela Anderson. She says, at some point, could we review these valuable issues of soil, water, et cetera, regarding container fruit trees uh, at some point, how often are how often do you see what are the indicators for repotting, repotting up your container fruit trees, 
and do I need to prune out the center of my very dense 15 year old citrus trees? So that's three questions in one from Michaela. I thought I had my phone muted. <laughs> um, okay, uh, yeah, well you do want to you know, trim out the center of your trees uh, if you're trying to grow that base shape plant or you just need to thin it out so that you, you're not sh you don't have too much shade. You need to have enough sunlight coming into branches Otherwise, you just get fruit production on the outer edges. And uh, that's okay on a small tree because you can reach it, but on a really big tree, it means it's all out of reach if it's just up on the, up on the canopy, the outer part of the canopy. Uh, container plants, uh, they're, they're, you, know, you have to keep them watered. Uh, small containers, you'll have to, in, in this time of year, you have to water those at least every day. Uh, my plants, uh, the containers even get so hot uh, that it, it'll damage the roots in many cases, especially if you're using those black plastic nursery pots. Um, so it takes a lot of water and you have to also add fertilizer more often to container plants because it doesn't get, it, it washes out of the, of the potting soil pretty quickly. So you want to add smaller amounts more often uh, to container plants to keep them healthy. And you do have to remove plants. If you're keeping a plant permanently in a container, uh, the roots eventually are going to exceed the size of the container. So you have to keep the plant, the top of the plant pruned down appropriately so it's not too big for the roots to support it. And then you periodically, uh, you take it out of the container and this can be difficult in a big container. I have a, uh, a whiskey barrel, half whiskey barrel with the citrus planted in it. And I need to actually, I need, I've been needing to do this for a couple of years. I need to actually dump that out and you trim off about a third of the roots. And at the same time you do that. So they call that root pruning that reinvigorates root growth. And then you plant, you put new potting soil in there because the potting soil breaks down and it doesn't have the same properties it had when it, when it was new. Okay, All right. Well, yeah. <laughs> There's a ton of questions coming oh, this, in. Well, ask, uh, ask me a couple more. Let me finish the presentation. And then we'll just ask as many as people want to hang around for at the end. Okay. From CS for the Q&A, tips for protecting new trees from gophers. Do you use gopher baskets successfully or do they inhibit root growth? No, I haven't, I haven't had needed to do that myself, but uh, I'm told go, gopher baskets can be effective, especially for young trees. The roots are going to grow well beyond the basket, but you're mostly trying to protect the tree when it's young and, and, and vulnerable to dying from the amount of damage that a gopher can do to it. A mature tree is much less likely to, it, it'll get damaged, but it's much less likely to die. And you can't really protect the roots of a tree. You just have to deal with uh, trying to eradicate the gophers. Brittany wants to know, can you eat the fruit that you thin from the tree? Also, if that fruit has worms, like apples, get them. Can I put the thin fruit with worms in my compost pile? Patricia points out that you can make chutney from sometimes from green unripened thin fruit. Oh, that's interesting. I never heard about making anything out of the thin fruit. I just, it always goes into my compost piles, uh, worms and all. <laughs> those, those, are, those are great for the compost, actually. That's not going to hurt anything. You, you normally don't want to put disease things into your compost. I don't think the worms and apples are the, that big a deal. You know, maybe throw that away because what's going to happen is that worm, you know, so-called worm is really a it's really a larva of a fly or a or or a you know a moth or something, and it's it's just going to grow into an adult and then infect another tree. So you probably want to destroy any any diseased or uh, infected material. But yeah, you know, otherwise composting is great. We got, we really do have a lot of more questions. Well, let me go ahead and finish this up. And then, uh, you know, and so then uh, we can ask anybody who wants to uh, hang around. So. Okay, Patricia wants you to address leaf curl and parasites. Uh, you're talking about peach leaf curl. Uh, that, well, you have to trim off any disease material. I let's see a peach leaf curl, I think is a fungal disease. Um, it's very common. Uh, you, you, you actually do that preventatively. You can't really effectively treat it uh, during the, the year you have it. So if you have it on there now, you can, you can remove some of the infected plant, uh, but you're not going to be able to get rid of the disease until the next year. And so what you do is you do uh, dormant, uh, dormant treatments uh, of either of sulfur, copper, and, and horticultural oils uh, during the dormant period, after all the leaves have dropped. Uh, I, I think the most important thing for uh, peach leaf curl are, is sulfur. It could be copper, I forget. But you can find copper and sulfur treatments that you spray on the tree uh, during the dormant season, and that prevents the disease uh, you know, as, it comes into, you know, as it comes out of dormancy. I just want to uh, answer our steward. Um, 
HLB identification will be addressed when Jeffrey gets to the HLB, um, the HLB part of the presentation. Wow. Okay, hang on. I've got a couple more here. I'm just trying to catch up with well, them. You know, Sarah, Sarah, let me go ahead. I'm going to finish the, uh, the presentation, then we'll okay. answer those questions afterwards. All righty. Okay, so let me go back. I got to click on the right thing, so it lets me move the slides. So citrus is super popular in California. Uh, they, they think about 60% of people, 60% of yards in California have at least one citrus tree. And that percentage is actually even higher here in Southern California. And uh, California is also a huge uh, producer of, uh, of citrus, second in the, in the country, second only to Florida, but we're actually the number one producer of fresh eating citrus. Uh, so here's the disease part of this talk. Uh, so this is a, there's a, a bacterial infection here called, that creates a disease called Wong Long Bing that came from Asia uh, back about 2012, it came to California. And in Florida where it started earlier, this has virtually, this has done, been devastating to their uh, commercial citrus as well as a uh, homeowner citrus. There's almost no one growing citrus now in their homes in Florida. It's all been taken out when they were trying to stop the spread of the disease. They, they failed, it spread throughout the citrus growing parts of the state. And now it's costing them literally billions a year. They've lost more than half their orchard production. Uh, and the orange juice we get now is actually daughter, doctored quite a bit now because they're using the infected fruit still to make orange juice and that fruit becomes bitter uh, and so they have to, you know, they can't use very much of it at one time. Uh, it's still safe for us. You know, the Wang Long Bing uh, bacteria has no effect on us, uh, but it's, uh, it's making the oranges and, and things, they don't color up properly, really terrible. So let me just go step by step through that. So the, the problem is it's being spread by this insect that's also invasive called the Asian citrus psyllid. It's only about the size of an aphid, a little tiny guy but they're very uh, easy to, to, uh, to distinguish from other insects because they feed with their head down and their back end up at this 45 degree angle. There's nothing else that does that. Uh, and so we wanna inspect your citrus regularly, especially when, it's, when there's new growth on there because this, this insect only lays eggs on that new growth. Uh, it's because the young, which I'll show you right here, well, here's the new growth, it's called feather flush. And you can see on the right picture, little tiny eggs. They're very hard to see. You'd have to have at least a 10X magnifier to really see them, uh, but they're, really, they're tucked into that new growth. And then as the uh, insects come out, the nymph stages of the insects look like this. And they're also really easy to distinguish because they, 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 ex they excrete uh, honeydew, just like aphids and scale insects do, but theirs is encapsulated in these waxy tubules that just hang down. So you'll be able to see these waxy tubules with your naked eye. And that's, that's, you know, that tells you you have this, uh, this insect. So the reason we're worried about the insect is not because of the damage the insect does. It does feeding damage just like an aphid does. In fact, it has a little toxin in its saliva that makes the leaves uh, twist and things, but it's not extensive, the tree is fine. But the problem is it can carry this bacteria. It can pick it up from a tree and it can deliver it to another tree. Uh, call, the bacteria is, is uh, abbreviated as CLAS, and it lives in the vascular tissue of the plant, the part where the sap is. And the insect, that's what the insect is feeding. And so the insect, when it feeds, can inject that into the plant, or if the plant has it, the insect can pick it up. And this disease, Wang Long Bing, uh, it has no cure. It start, it's, it's been in China for 100 years now, so they've been dealing with it for a long time, but we only got it here in 2012. And it's called either yellow shoot disease, it translates as yellow shoot disease or yellow dragon disease because of the fact that you'll, you'll see it just in part of the tree initially, you get these yellow canopies. So it's, it's hard to actually identify the disease. It can look like a nutritional deficiency. You can see the leaves here are chlorotic. Uh, the, uh, the one thing that's different from other types of nutritional deficiencies is that the left side of the leaf and the right side will be different looking. It's not symmetrical. And if you flip the leaf over, you can look at the veins in the back. They'll often be thick and corky looking. Still very hard to distinguish. It can look like other things. As the disease progresses, the fruit starts, particularly oranges, with, uh, they don't color up. They'll stay green on the bottom. And, uh, and then the fruit, as it gets worse and worse, the fruit gets smaller, it gets asymmetrical looking, and eventually it starts just dropping off the tree. 
and the juice becomes bitter and it's just unusable at that point. So here you can see here in the tree where it, uh, just one branch right now, that tree is infected. And, and that's another way to distinguish it from nutritional deficiency, which will be throughout the tree. But a disease may be only in part of the tree. It takes time for that disease to spread throughout the tree. Eventually, the tree looks like it does on the right, where the fruit doesn't color up right. You, you don't have a lot of leaves. The tree just doesn't look healthy anymore. And eventually, it dies. On the right is a grove in Florida. Uh, this is a common site in Florida. Uh, particularly the trees that are on the perimeter of the grove, those are the, the insects prefer the, the perimeter trees because they like all the light for some reason. And so you'll see, they typically have to take those trees out and replant them. So if, you're, if your tree has this disease, it has to be destroyed. Uh, it's going to die in a few years anyway, so you don't want to keep it. So right now, the disease is in four counties, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino. Uh, every month or two, I get a, a notice from uh, the, the, the CDFA that they're expanding the quarantine somewhere. This is what it looks like right now. Uh, the infection started in Hacienda Heights because someone went to China, uh, brought back some cuttings of a citrus plant that they grafted into their tree. And the cuttings had the bacteria in there. That's why we have to go through inspections with all our plant materials because of all the disease and insects we can bring back in. And so this happened and fortunately the CDFA eventually found this tree and, and destroyed it. But by that time it already started spreading. The insect is everywhere in Southern California. Um, we, uh, we're not trying to eliminate that anymore. We are trying to just try to suppress the numbers. Uh, they're releasing these little tiny uh, parasitic wasps that, uh, that, kill the, uh, that kill the aphid, that kill the psyllid. And those are helping, um, but it's not really enough to control it. So we're just gonna, we're gonna have to live with that insect. But we are gonna try to control the disease and not turn it into Florida. So this is a map that the Master Gardener program created that makes it easier for you to see if you have uh, this disease near you. So uh, when you get the, the PowerPoint, you just click on that link and, uh, or the PDF rather, and it'll take you to a site where you can put in your address and it'll show you if you're within two miles of an infection, you get a red circle. If you're if within five miles, you only get the yellow circle. And if you're outside five miles, you get a green circle. The red uh, squares are where they have destroyed trees that were infected. So this is the Huntington where I do some volunteering. Uh, they got a beautiful garden there and they do have a citrus grove and they're now within two miles of an infection found, I think it was in Alhambra. And uh, that means their trees very likely are already infected. You know, if, it, if it's this close, they probably already have it. The problem is the disease takes time to show itself. It can take, uh, one or two years before you see any, any signs of the infection. Meanwhile, the tree is still infectious. It can still spread the disease. Uh, and so that's why it's been so hard to control. So what you can do as a homeowner is just inspect, the, inspect your citrus, particularly that new flush, look for the insect uh, in, you know, in either stage of life. And if you do have it, you can do some uh, nice organic methods of trying to control the insect population. One thing is to plant habitat for beneficial insects that'll eat the psyllids, like ladybugs and lacewings and uh, the parasitic wasps. They all like flowers that are, have nice flat, you know, sort of uh, surfaces on them, call them umbels, uh, like cilantro here when it bolts. Uh, those are great flowers for these insects because they like to eat the pollen of those flowers. And so having lots of flowers in our garden uh, is a huge benefit to, uh, to, to controlling uh, the bad insects. Uh, if you do need to spray something, uh, start off with the soft insecticides like oils and soaps. Uh, those, don't, those aren't damaging, they're not toxic to us, and they're not as bad for the beneficials, although you know, if you spray a ladybug, with, <laughs> with the, they're not gonna like it either. And then the, the really importantly, uh, you wanna control ants. Ants harvest honeydew from honeydew producing insects like the psyllids and they protect them from their enemies. And so if a ladybug is trying to eat uh, one of these psyllids and an ant's there, the ant's gonna fight the ladybug. And, and, so, it's, and so you're not gonna get the control you want. So we wanna control ants with, uh, with low toxicity baits uh, that are made with boric acid usually. And the sticky berry, like you see in the picture there, there's a product called Tanglefoot, but there's other products. You wrap the tree with a piece of cloth and then you, 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 you spoon on this really sticky material and the ants can't get up into the tree. And pruning waste, of course, you know, if your gardener is pruning your tree, uh, make sure that the cuttings are not going into your green waste. You can compost them, 
but you don't want to let the cuttings go into green waste because that's sending possibly sending the disease and the insect uh, on, a, on, a, on a trip in, uh, somewhere else. So if you don't want to leave those cuttings on the ground for a couple of weeks to dry out, uh, you can double bag them and throw them in with your regular trash, not in your green waste. Um, otherwise, the easiest thing to do is just leave them on the ground for a couple of weeks and then you can, you can dispose of them how you normally would. So if you do think you have the disease, uh, you can call the CDFA. They have a hotline and, a, and, a web, uh, and an email address uh, and let them know. They'll come out and inspect your tree. They'll do a test. It's actually a, a DNA test, similar to how COVID is, is, uh, is tested. Uh, to, uh, and to see if you really have the disease or not. And if you do, they're going to come out and destroy your tree. And that's a good thing. They're going to actually dig it all the way out to the roots. So there is a little good news. I hate to leave on bad news. Uh, last month, a, a researcher at UC Riverside announced that they had discovered a substance inside Australian finger limes, which are a very cool fruit to begin with. Um, uh, they, they call it citrus caviar. You squeeze it and they, all the little vesicles come out like caviar. These are getting to be popular down here, but it turns out this plant is also beneficial. It's fairly resistant to the disease. It does get infected, but the bacteria has a hard time living inside the finger lime. And so they try to figure out why that was. And it turned out there's a short, uh, it's a small protein or what they call a peptide that has antimicrobial uh, properties that uh, kills that bacteria. And so they're now spraying trees and injecting them uh, with, with this uh, peptide. And they think this might be a really effective control agent. It's still early days. They haven't peer reviewed this yet. Uh, it's not available to us yet, but, uh, but the other people I've talked to are very hopeful this is going to be a big deal. So you can get more information on the disease and insect by going to the university's uh, IPM website. That's a terrific website. If you haven't discovered this as a gardener, you really want to uh, 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 just do a search for UC IPM. Uh, and they have terrific information on all sorts of uh, pests and diseases, uh, either organized by plant or organized by the pest. Um, and one of the best websites out there. Uh, and always, you know, I'm doing this as part of a grant. We have a grant with the California Department of Food and Agriculture to educate the public about this disease, but we're also encouraging people to eat more fruits and vegetables for a healthier lifestyle. So you can get information from USDA at their MyPlate uh, website. Um, and there's also a lot of great places for healthy recipes. We, uh, we use eatfresh.org. That's put out by CalFresh, which is part of the food stamp program. And they have recipes in English, uh, Spanish, and Chinese. In fact, I just tried the apple celery slaw the other day. It was pretty good. I think it needs a little something, but I liked it. <laughs> and you can get more information by going to our website. It's called Alternatives to Citrus. Uh, you can just search for that. And we have more information. We post a few recipes on there as well. And, uh, other, and we have a newsletter that, we'll, that we post there as well. I want to learn more about fruit trees and orchard care. Lots of great resources. There's just a few. The university puts out the California Backyard Orchard website. Uh, the California Rare Fruit Growers, I mentioned, a great organization. There's, left, there's four chapters in LA County. I belong to the Foothill chapter, and I also belong to one in Orange County. And uh, this is not just for exotic fruit. It sounds like rare fruit is this exotic. A lot of people are just growing apples and oranges, and we talk about all those things. But you also learn about a lot of Crazy stuff that I never even got into. Uh, lots and lots of, of fruit trees that most people have never heard about. Uh, California, our, our Master Gardener Handbook that we used it, uh, that's used for our training is a, has a great chapter on fruit trees and another great, great chapter on citrus. Uh, and there's two books, The Home Orchard and, uh, and Fruit Trees for Every Garden. I just, I just started reading Fruit Trees for Every Garden. It's terrific. So, and then if you're interested in finding nurseries that carry uh, more tropical fruits, uh, the California Red Fruit Growers has a list of nurseries throughout the, throughout the area, but uh, you can find the ones that are local. So you can also go to our, our Master Gardener website. Uh, we have you know, gardening tips there. If you're interested in becoming a Master Gardener, they take applications starting in November. Um, and uh, we have a helpline where you can put questions in. You can also use our Facebook. We have a, a new Facebook page called Ask a LA County Master Gardener. We're taking questions there. Uh, we, you know, of course, our YouTube channel. And just last week, we started an Instagram page, so that's brand new. Uh, we're also doing workshops uh, uh, twice a month. We just did one uh, a couple days ago. Uh, actually, it was, just, it was, yeah, it was Tuesday. Uh, they're going to be Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Uh, next one is August 11th. And it's just you know, general gardening topics. We usually cover maybe 
three topics, little mini workshops. Uh, recently, our the head of our orchard team, Herb Mackletter, has been uh, doing some pruning talks, and those are those. I think you know, if you're interested in fruit trees, you really want to watch those pruning talks. We're also we're going to keep keep adding more of those on on as we go. And then uh, Master Gardens in LA County also have another program called Grow LA uh, Victory Garden. And that is a four, it's usually a four class series. Uh, we're gonna be doing it online this fall. And it'll start, you know, the announcement for those locations and uh, the information on how to sign up will be available at, either on our website or you can go to this link or just search for uh, Grow LA Victory Garden. It always comes right up. So this is my contact information. You're welcome to email me. Uh, I'm at the LA County Fair every year. Normally, we go in there in three weeks ago. It wasn't closed this year. And we set up a Master Gardener booth there at the farm. And so I hope to see you guys there next year with any luck. So anyway, thank you very much for, you know, for attending this. Let's, let's take any questions we have at this point. Uh, first thing, so that to keep you on track, uh, Michaela Anderson said, Jeff's presentation is so excellent, it should be given an award. I agree. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> All right. And All right. Kit, Kit wants to know, when using wood chips to mulch, can you use fresh wood chips directly from the wood chip drop service, or do the wood chips needs to, need to be aged first? Should I be concerned about getting wood chips that come from diseased trees and then potentially infecting my trees? The, the free mulch we get is just freshly uh, chipped up uh, tree material. And it can contain uh, some diseases, but research has shown it doesn't really spread to our garden. Uh, so it really hasn't been a problem. I don't think you have to be concerned about that. The only things that concern me are uh, materials like black walnut. Uh, black walnut has chemicals in it that suppresses seedlings from germinating. And so it's fine for you know, weed suppression, but if you're putting it around an area in your garden where you might wanna grow seeds, uh, you wouldn't wanna have black, uh, black walnut in there. Uh, but for the most part, everything breaks down. It's usually all fine. You don't need to let it age. Uh, you can put it down immediately. It, 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 you know, when you get that big pile, the pile is about four feet tall and maybe four feet wide. And uh, that's a great compost pile. It's a mixture of the brown material from the, from the wood that got chipped up, plus all the leaves that got chipped up. And so it immediately starts heating up and composting. And it only, it's only going to do that for a few days, and then the leaves get used up. Uh, but when you spread it out, it's going to cool off right away. So you don't have to worry about it cooking anything. Um, uh, and you will bring in some insects. I end up bringing in some uh, uh, earwigs into my yard that I hadn't had before. And they're a little bit of a pest, but not a really bad pest. Uh, I think the, uh, the benefits far outweigh the, the risks, though, for doing this. Eva Chan wants to know, she says, I recently moved my five-year-old avocado tree from one location to a different location at the end of spring. It completely dried out and everything looks browned and dead. Can it be saved? Will it come back to life? Well, it's hard to know without looking at the tree what kind of condition it's in, but uh, avocados are very sensitive and moving them is not a great idea in general, um, but I understand sometimes you have to. Uh, if, you know, if, 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 you gotta make sure that it's not buried too deep and, and getting waterlogged. Uh, but of course, a lot depends on your soil and how you're maintaining that tree. It's really hard to say. I don't know if it's gonna come back or not. Uh, it, you may have to replace it. Margaret Mahoney, we have a couple of citrus trees that used to produce small pr fruit, probably because we didn't thin prune, but now the trees have very few leaves and no fruit. Is there a resource to send pictures or have someone come out and look at the trees to help diagnose and treat them? Well, I don't have any resource that'll come out for free to diagnose your trees. Master gardeners don't do that. We don't go to people's homes. We just do things at community um, centers and things. Um, but you can send pictures to our helpline. You can use our Facebook site and also send pictures uh, and, and get some answers. You can also, it's a really good idea, you know, if you bought the tree at a particular nursery, you know, bag up some, some, some leaves and take them into the nursery and see what they have to say about it. Um, but yeah, you can get answers for what it is. I, it's hard to know, there's a million things, there's lots of other citrus diseases. Citrus is, citrus is also susceptible to crown and root rot. It doesn't like to be buried. If you, uh, some people have uh, re-landscaped and they end up burying their trees deeper than they originally were. And with citrus, that's gonna kill it pretty quickly. This is Monica. Um, yeah, Monica Michael Chavez asks, do hummingbirds eat uh, tree bugs? 
Uh, as far as I know, hummingbirds, I thought hummingbirds were just nectar feeders, but I'm no expert on birds. <laughs> so if they eat some insects, that's great. I, I don't know that they do though, sorry. All right, my the other, other birds, lizards right. in your yard, they're eating insects, birds are eating insects, you know. Uh, that's great if you're trying to get rid of the caterpillars on your tomatoes, not so great if, you're, if they're eating your monarch caterpillars, but you know, it's just, that's that balance we, we live with. Are there any trees that we should try to have more of in Southern California? Like the more there are in an area, the better they are for each other. It's an interesting question. Well, I mean, when it comes to fruit trees, you, you want to plant, well, I was talking about trees that need a companion plant. They need some, a, a, a pollen source. So it's always a good idea to have, uh, even ones that don't require a, a, a pollinizer, uh, they actually will produce more fruit if they have a pollinizer. So, you know, peaches don't require, uh, you can have a single peach tree and have pretty good production. But if you have a second peach tree, the production will be even better. You want to try to pick varieties that flower at the same time, though. So that pollen's available on both plants for the bees to take back and forth. Richard Seeloff says he has larvae in just about every cherry. Any way to combat without hardcore toxins? Yes, there's a product. That I just actually ordered it from a nursery uh, in Orange County. It's called Kaolin Clay, K-A-O-L-I-N Clay. It's actually the same material that's used to make porcelain. It's a very fine clay. Uh, there's a, the product, you, you can buy it you know, from, from, from places that sell hobby products. It's used in cosmetics. It's used in pottery. Uh, but you can, there's, a, a, there's a product for the nursery industry called Surround. Uh, I think it's WD. Surround WD, I think is it. Anyway, it's a big bag of clay. And you, you put it in water and you spray it on the trees. And it coats the trees, the leaves, the fruit with a thin layer of this powder. And the insects aren't able to lay their eggs on the fruit. And then, and then the, you know, and then the little worm, you know, doesn't form in that case. And it's completely non-toxic, you just wash it off. So you want to, you want to apply it, of course, when it's not raining. Uh, if it rains, it's gonna wash off, you'll have to reapply it. Uh, but that's used a lot in the, in, in the, in, in, in the uh, you know, in the trade. It's used on olives, it's used on a lot of different fruit. And they recommend it actually for oranges to, or for citrus in general, to, uh, to keep the psyllids from, uh, from infecting a leaf with, with the disease. Binky Smith says, I got some wood chips from a tree trimmer and I noticed it has mold. If I put this first in a compost pile before using it around the tree, would the mold die off when the compost heats up? Well, most of the molds in our soils are good. Uh, in fact, uh, woody mulch attracts molds like nothing else. They love molds. And what happens when your woody mulch sits for a year, uh, it starts, a network of mold forms in it and it, it kind of sticks it all together. So you, it'll become big clumps. And that's actually a very good thing. There are some there are some bad molds like armillaria, which uh, which uh, it makes little mushrooms uh, at the base of trees. It'll harm the trees. But by and large, the woody mulch, uh, the molds in woody mulch are a good thing. Okay, from Marlene Suzuki, my kumquat tree doesn't produce. That's all she wrote. <laughs> Kumquats, you know, kumquats are usually really easy. They don't need any kind of pollination pollination from another plant. Uh, the, uh, the, they, I don't think, uh, the, the, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, cold chill issue in citrus. You don't have to have winter chill uh, for them to produce. I'm not sure why that plant's not producing. Uh, they normally produce quite well. You might try pruning it a little bit that sometimes invigorates the plant uh, to do more growing. And it may just be a disease issue. If it looks good and it's not producing, is, is it flowering? Um, if it's flowering and you're not getting fruit, it's because you know, the bees aren't doing the pollination job. That can be a problem. Um, I'm not sure. I've never tried hand pollinating uh, those little flowers, but you might just get a little, a little brush and uh, move it around the flower. Uh, uh, citrus flowers are what they call uh, perfect flowers. They're the male and female parts. And so all you have to do is uh, put a little brush in there and that'll move the pollen around and, and fertilize it. All right, Patricia says she always makes green peach chutney delicious and less wasteful. I agree as a master food reserver. Well said, Patricia. Shirley wants to know how to prevent and protect oranges from being poked uh, in, by birds, poke, uh, poked and rotted by birds, making holes and rotting away. Yeah, well, birds are a problem with it for, for all sorts of fruit trees. Uh, I've got figs in ripe right now and the birds are having a heyday with the figs. Uh, the, there's a few 
there's a couple things I know of. One is to put on bird netting over the tree. So if the tree is not too huge to manage this, you can, you can net the whole tree. The birds are only then able to reach the fruit through the net and everything further in is protected. You have to make sure it goes all the way to the ground and, and tie it at the trunk of the tree. Uh, it's gonna, you know, or you may, you have to make it so you can get in there when you want to get in there. But if you leave an opening, the birds get in and then they, you know, they get in and out that way. And I had, I did this last year. I'm not doing it again because I ended up killing a bird. He got caught in the netting and died. Uh, and so I decided to live with it. There's another product that's based on the extract from Concord grapes. It's the same thing they use in, in grape Kool-Aid. That compound uh, apparently is very noxious to birds. They don't like the smell of it. And wow. so there are people, they sell this product. Uh, if you look for, they use it a lot for geese and things as well. I forget what the product's called, but it's like a grape Kool-Aid thing. If you look, if you look for that, you'll, you'll find something. Uh, you spray that on your trees. It's gonna make everything smell like grape Kool-Aid, uh, but it, it'll keep some of the birds away. It's not 100% effective from what I've seen though. How close, this is from Farah Mars. Um, how closely can you plant trees that you prune to grow tall and thin with a strong central leader? to max out the height of dwarf stock? Well, you're not trying to, you generally don't want to max out the height of your trees. Uh, in fact, the, the trend, even in commercial orchards, is to grow short trees that you can reach all the fruit from the ground without using a ladder. Uh, it's, uh, and then you can plant more varieties together in, this, in a small space. Like I showed you, you can grow you know, three or four trees in a hole that are right next to each other. Um, but you need some space in there because everything needs to get that sunlight. And so you don't want to pack them in like a, like a, so your, you know, your orchard looks like a nursery. All the trees are all packed together because none of those trees are getting enough uh, sunlight to develop good fruit. From our steward to everybody, I'm not sure if my lemon tree has this disease or is it just nutritionally deficient? Is it fairly certain we have the disease if we definitely have psyllids, waxy tubules? No, no, not at all. The, uh, the psyllids uh, outside the quarantine are not infected. Uh, yeah, and right now, but you know, that, that, you know, there are going to be trees outside the quarantine and still is outside the quarantine that are infected. But for the most part, the further away you are from the known quarantine area, the, the less likely those psyllids are infected. You do want to still control the psyllids because it's, it's slowly coming and you, you want to protect your trees if you can. Uh, and most likely what you're seeing is some kind of nutritional deficiency. Citrus very commonly has like magnesium deficiencies, zinc deficiencies. They, they sell these citrus uh, nutrient sprays, you know, it, virtually everywhere, you know, big box places have it, uh, that you can spray on the, on the leaves of the tree to do a quick fix. And then you can use, uh, like you can put micronutrients in the soil by using rock dust uh, that, you, that you can get at some nurseries and you just mix that into the soil. That provides uh, all the small nutrients that the, the plant needs and it'll, it'll help with those, uh, the, those discolored leaves. Sorry Jeff, hang that. tight, because we have a ton more questions here. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask everybody at this point to hold off, because otherwise we're going to be on this Zoom call for the next two hours. Um, so if you haven't asked a question yet, save it up, write to Jeff directly. Sorry, Jeff, to put that on you. Uh, <laughs> But All right, I, I didn't train you very well, okay. No, you didn't. <laughs> That's funny. Patricia, to everyone, can fruit be traded across city lines if you move, remove the leaves? Uh, th that was the original advice, that just take the leaves off and it was fine to move. Now they're actually recommending that we, ne we don't move any of our citrus fruit off of our properties if you're in the HLB quarantine. Uh, that's because even though the insects don't uh, eat the fruit uh, and they're not going to pick up the disease from infected fruit, uh, they can sometimes hitch a ride on the fruit. I just recommend people uh, uh, take all the leaves off, take the stems off, and then rinse it off really good and then bag it up so the insects aren't going to be attracted to it. And then, and then it's pretty safe to, to, to uh, give to friends and things. All right, from our steward, what else do you recommend for ants other than boric acid? You know, that's the only uh, toxin that I recommend for, for ants is boric acid or borax. Uh, they're a little bit different and sometimes alternating between the two uh, gives you better results. Uh, you want to make a solution that is not too strong. I think uh, uh, the university recommends a 1% solution. If you look on their site, if you first search for boric acid ants, you'll find uh, uh, one of the UC IPM uh, notes on how to do this. And you put it in a little container 
if you make it too strong, it'll kill the ants before they get back to the nest. And so you want a weak solution that they get back, they take back to the nest, and so they're going to kill the rest of the ants. It's almost impossible to get rid of the Argentine ant that we have here in California now. It's an invader, and it forms these super colonies. Normally, ant colonies fight each other, and, and so they have their territories. Uh, Argentine ants have territories that are in your, your entire neighborhood. Uh, and so you can you can you have to continuously keep trying to, uh, to control them, um, but I don't know of anything else that's really that effective, and it's not toxic. Richard Seeloff is saying, are there any other cultivars other than the green one which we have? And I think, as I recall, he was referring to the finger limes. Uh, yeah, there are. There, Australia has tons of different cultivars, but in order to get new citrus into California, it has to go through our citrus clonal protection program. Uh, they take any new citrus has to go to them first and they test it for all sorts of diseases. And if it has a disease, they're actually able to take little bits of tissue from the tips of buds on the tree and propagate it with it, it, eliminating even viruses. And so that's, that's the only place new citrus comes into the state. And I don't think they have anything right now except for the green finger lime. I have heard somebody say that they do have other varieties of finger limes that are in testing right now. So hopefully those will show up soon. Celine wants to know what's the best time of year to plant fuyus and jujubes. Uh, I don't know specifically for those two, but usually you know, fall and spring are the best times to plant trees. You want the weather to be cool uh, when you're planting. Uh, fall is a great time to start a lot of new plants if they're available in the nursery at that time, because it gives them a chance to, uh, to get established in the cool weather. They grow their roots and then they're ready to take off in the spring. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure exactly when those become available in the nursery because I, I don't have either one. We do have an orchard team, so if you address the helpline, maybe they could answer that question. Uh, for, that's for the Master Gardener helpline. David Sokolov wants to know, are there any retail insecticide products that are effective against the HLB psyllid? Oh yeah, there's the, the commercial nurseries are spraying like crazy with uh, combinations of uh, ni neonicotinoids and pyrethrins. Uh, they, they, spray, they, they soak the, the soil with uh, the neonicotinoids that get taken up systemically, and then they spray the leaves uh, with the other insecticide, the pyrethrins. Uh, you can do that yourself. You can hire someone to do it. It's just, it's just toxic. It's going to kill beneficial insects. And so as a master gardener, I don't recommend that. But, you know, that's really up to you if you want to go that route. Ooh. I just just now reading what uh, our steward is saying about a one percent solution for ants with creamy jiffy peanut butter. That's in oh the yeah top yeah he yeah. Well, some there. well some ants are attracted to fats and some are, are sweets. Mostly uh, the the Argentine ants are attracted to sweet, uh, but it depends what kind of ants you have. Okay, Brittany wants some advice on woolly aphids. She's got them on her orange and lemon trees. So uh, aphids are soft body insects. They're pretty easy to control by just spraying them off. When they get knocked to the ground, they usually don't come, come back up. And they, most of the aphids are not flying aphids, and so they won't be able to fly back up. Uh, insecticidal soaps. Those are a little bit different than our dish soaps. They're made from potassium salts and fatty acids uh, instead of sodium salts, which you don't really want on your plants. And so the, if you look online for insecticidal soap, you'll find those available. Uh, those are very effective against soft-bodied insects, as well as oils like horticultural oil and neem oil. Um, they work really well. Um, just just don't use it. Just don't use it when it's hot out. Both of those things will call, cause burn, sunburn on your plants if you use it when the sun's really bright and hot. So uh, do it. Do it. Uh, do it uh, like in the. Do it right when the sun's going down, and then by the morning it's dried off. It'll be okay. We're having comments about uh, neo. Uh, Sorry, I, I always get, I always say it wrong. Neonicotinoids, I, yeah. I stutter when I say it. No, it, it kills bees. And so, you know, we're curious. Yeah, all these insecticides will kill, will kill bees and other beneficial insects. Uh, if you do need to use them, you, you want to use them when the insects aren't present. So very early in the morning or in the evening when they've got, well, at least the bees will have gone away. The insects may be sleeping there or the, the, the ladybugs and things. So you're not killing them too. 
I have at least eight more questions, so I just maybe we can answer them very quickly and move on. Farrah Mars wants to know, how do we measure chill hours here? Is that the total number of hours between 30 and 45 degrees, or is there a minimum number of hours in each block of chill hours for it to be effective? For example, should we only count chill hours if they happen in blocks of X number of hours or more? Uh, you know, there's some recent, you know, this whole chill hour model is oversimplified. Uh, there's, there's other versions of it. For instance, one version, if it warms up during the winter above like 70, then they start subtracting chill hours. And so it's actually very complicated. Uh, so it, it's just a guideline. Uh, it, it actually turns out uh, Tom Spellman, who I mentioned, has done some research with taking high chill apples down to Irvine where they get very little winter chill and they're actually producing pretty well. And so it turns out for those particular apples, a chill may not be what we thought it was, uh, but it, it is a good guideline to look at. And you'd have to look at those stations to see which uh, the closest one to you to see wh what it is in your hours. It's hard to track it yourself. Do, okay, from Brittany, uh, do macadamia nuts need another tree to produce fruit? Uh, I'm not sure about macadamia nuts. You have to, if you go to the, uh, the website I showed you, the, uh, the orchard, uh, backyard orchard that UC puts out, I think they cover macadamia nuts and they'll say on that site. Uh, Richard Seeloff, are there other breeds of, oh, we did that finger limes. Okay, uh, Gloria G, I hear, uh, Gloria, I don't understand your question, but you said something about, I hear deaf people having success hitting their tree with a bat. I don't understand what that's about, but if you want to weigh in uh, before, if you're still there, we'll, we'll try <laughs> you know, to figure out I don't want to hear can. more about that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I don't have anything to comment on right now. All right, we've got four or five more. Uh, Edward Stoddart, uh, our loquat didn't produce fruits this year, but the leaves are very healthy. Maybe that's just a comment in response to the other person. Well, I can say but, something about loquat. Some, okay. some varieties of loquat require a companion pollinizer. I bought a loquat last year called Champagne. Uh, and I could have just looked up on my phone to see if it required a pollinizer. I didn't do it. And so I've got that in the backyard right now. And it didn't flower this year. It should flower next year. But uh, I'm going to have to get a second loquat in there in order to have any fruit. So that's, that's how it goes. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's a couple more questions still rolling in. But here, here's the, the one. Yeah, I can, I can hang around as long as you can okay. hang around, uh, right. Sarah. And people you know, can hang around as long as they want. I'm fine. All right, so Celine says, can you recommend local resource for subtropical and tropical fruits? She's especially interested in Fuyu and Jujube. Uh, if you go to the, uh, there's a, well, LA County has a couple of, uh, uh, well, Fuyu persimmons should be pretty easy to find. That's going to be very popular. Uh, Jujube is a little less so. Uh, there's Champa Nursery in El Monte. There's also Mimosa Nursery in East LA. Uh, there are other nurseries. If you go to the California Rare Fruit Growers, they have a list of, of nurseries that specialize in fruit trees. You'll be able to find, uh, find and you have to just call around and see who has what. Gloria says, for people who aren't getting fruit, some found benefit whacking their tree with a bat, and those who did it swear by it. So maybe that's Well, so, some, some uh, okay, so if a flower is perfect, and it has the pollen and the female parts of the flower, uh, all you have to do is somehow dislodge that pollen maybe and it might land on the stigma and, and pollinate it. And so you can do it like tomatoes, for instance. Uh, the easiest thing to pollinate a tomato is just to go and flick the flower with your finger and that's going to pollinate it. The wind does that for you. Insects do that too. Like you, you might find bumblebees, they do something called buzz pollination. So they're in the flower and they buzz and it does the same thing as probably the bat's doing. It's just vibrating it and spreading the pollen. All right. We have... Uh... I think Michaela made a comment that her five-year-old potted kumquat is doing prolifically well. She grows African blue basil and borage near it. They're major bee magnets. And from Isolt uh, to Terrific. everyone, will the mold in the moldy chips be killed off when the compost pile heats up? What's the quickest way to heat up the pile? Uh, you're talking about compost pile or, or yeah. the pile of wood chips? Ah, uh, good question. She's well. She's saying, "Will the mold in the compo in the moldy chips be killed off when the compost pile heats up?" Yeah, it will. What happens if you if, if you have a big enough compost pile? It can heat up to over 130 degrees. That'll kill off uh, a lot of different things. In fact, different bacteria. The bacteria change as your compost pile heats up because, yeah. because the bacteria that started off uh, uh, like the cool 
And then bacteria that like the heat, these call these thermal something bacteria, they'll, they'll, change, they'll replace them as the pile gets hotter and hotter. And so, yeah, worms will move away. The fungus will probably get killed. Pathogens get killed. It also, it'll kill seeds as well. So you won't get seed growth. Most of us, though, aren't able to create a pile that stays hot long enough because it takes a large pile, at least a three by three by three pile. You have to build it all at once with the right ratio of greens and browns in order to get it to really heat up and compost quickly. Uh, for me, I don't ever have enough material at one time, so I'm doing something called slow or cool composting, and it takes a good year for my uh, material to fully break down before I'm ready to use it in the garden. And it does not kill weed seeds, and so I get, you know, I get weeds coming up from my compost, uh, and it won't kill diseases either. So it all depends on how you're able to compost. All right. Now I think we're down to literally the last three at this point. Uh, Lamara, <laughs> are container citrus plants also in danger? Are there any less chance of infection? Uh, no difference. Uh, even if it's in your house, uh, you know, insects get in the house as well. I, I, I start all my plants inside. And I've had aphids and fungus gnats and everything else. They find the plants, even if they're indoors. I'm assuming the psyllid might find an indoor plant as well. There's, there's really no advantage to uh, a potted plant, except that you could put a little, you know, you can screen it off. They actually sell these, uh, these little uh, tents to put around our citrus, you know, aimed for just this problem uh, it, it, with a very fine mesh. And, and it keeps the insect from getting inside. Uh, but other than that, they're just as susceptible as a, as a you know, a, a tree planted in the ground. Richard was asking further what variety of cherry best adapted for LA count, County Coastal. Um, wait, yeah, Coastal LA County. Monica pointed out, look at Dave Wilson Nursery. Um, I just recently read about a cherry that's particularly good in LA County, but I can't remember which one it is. Do you? Uh, okay, so cherries, uh, only recently did they have cherries with, that required low chill, and so there's a couple of varieties. Dave Wilson has at least two varieties. Other, other, other producers may too. Uh, one's like Mini Royal and Royal something. I, I don't remember exactly what they're called. I think that one of the pictures I had, had had two of them. You have to have two trees in that case. They need a pollinizer uh, to get much production, but they're, they're very low chill. They're like, you know, 150 hours or something. Still, Santa Monica, is that what they said, Santa Monica? I didn't hear what- No, the, I, I just coastal, remember was coastal. LA, yeah, they were asking LA coastal. LA yeah, coastal. I mean, some part, some coastal areas get more chill, depends where you are. Uh, they're gonna do okay. They're not gonna produce as much as they would if they got a little better chill. I do actually believe that, I'm, I'm gonna look at the screen one more time, but I am, pretty, uh, there's one more. Okay, <laughs> nope, there we go, that's it. That's it. I'm gonna give you the very last question, which is from Brittany. I have two, uh, I have two, a baby, two baby olive trees. One looks good, the other looks sad. One has some white stuff on the branches. I think it's sick. Does it sound like a disease? Uh, okay, some white stuff on the branches. Uh, that could be a, a mold of some kind. Uh, it could also be scale insects. There are some scale insects like cottony cushion scale that make this waxy, fuzzy material around them. Uh, uh, in both cases, using uh, something like neem oil or insecticidal soap will help with those problems. Uh, especially with a fungus, the neem oil works pretty well. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, if, it's, if it's a fungus, uh, it's hard. You, know, you might want to pick off the leaves if you can. Uh, fungus is hard to control. Like if you have a, you know, like if, uh, compared to something like a, you know, growing a squash in the yard, it gets powdery mildew. You never fully get rid of it. You're just trying to keep it from spreading. Uh, but with the with with the, with the, with with fungus on tree leaves, eventually those leaves fall off and get replaced, and then hopefully by that time the fungus is you know you control the problem and everything's well. So uh, again, now we got two more questions. We're going to try to stop at this point. Um, okay. First of all, comment from uh, I've forgotten now who I think Brittany said that neem oil will kill baby caterpillars. So if you're concerned about butterflies, be careful where you spray. Um, I, I have lost track of who just wrote this. Oh, Isolt. Uh, my gala apple tree looks sad. I applied worm castings and fish emulsion recently. What should I do? Well, I don't know if sad's a technical <laughs> IPM <laughs> term, uh, so it's hard to know exactly. Uh, it, it, you know, there could be watering issues, there could be nutrient issues, there could be disease issues. It's really hard to tell. I would, I would take some pictures uh, take some far, far pictures so we can see the whole tree and then take some good close-up pictures 
and send them to our helpline. That that will that'll be that is the make, best it, make it possible to you know, come up with some kind of an answer. <laughs> so uh, it looks like fi final comment here, uh, Judy Gomez, our MG Judy Gomez, to oh, everyone. Judy, hi. My cherry tree is called a Royal Crimson Cherry from Dave Wilson, self-fruitful and requires two to 300 chill hours. That looks like we've done it, you guys. Well, that's looks a like we've perfect choice, self-fruitful too. And I, I will point out that a lot of the trees that are being marketed as self-fruitful by the nurseries are, are not self-fruitful according to the other experts. Uh, they may be a little bit or partially self-fruitful, so you get some, some crop, and you'll do much better if you have a second tree. Well, it seems to me we've gotten through everything, Jeff. A pretty darn good presentation. Well, thank you all very much. I hope you're able to fill out the survey. That's going to help us with our grant. And, uh, and uh, yeah, visit us uh, in a couple of weeks at our next Garden in Place workshop.